Chapter Eight, Part Two of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Eight, On the Night Wire, Part Two. At five thirty in the morning, Number Eighty One, the local freight west making a meeting point, rattled her long string of flats and boxes on the Angel Forks siding, and the kid on knotting his bandage, dropped it into a drawer of his desk. Branahan, number 81's conductor, kicked the door open and came in for his orders. "'Hello, kid!' exclaimed Branahan. "'What you sitting in for? Where's your mate?' "'I'll sleep!' the kid laughed at him. "'Well, you suppose he is. We're swapping tricks for a while for the sake of variety.' Branahan stooped and lunged the stub of the cigar in his mouth over the lamp chimney, and with the updraft nearly extinguished the flame. Then he pulled up a chair, tilted back, and stuck his feet up on the desk. "'Guess most anything would be a variety in this godforsaken hole,' he observed between puffs. "'But, oh, it's not so bad when you get used to it,' said the kid. He edged his own chair around to face Branahan squarely. The wound in the back of his head was bleeding again. Perhaps it had never stopped bleeding, he did not know. Branahan made small talk, waiting for the fast freight east to cross, and the kid smiled while his fingers clutched desperately now and then at the arms of his chair to keep himself from pitching over, as those sickening, giddy waves like hot and cold flashes swept him. Branahan went at last, the fast freight roared by, number 81 pulled out, and the kid went back to the wash basin and put his bandage on again. The morning came and went, the afternoon and the evening, and by evening the kid was sick and dropping weak. That smash on his head must have been more serious than he had thought at first, for again and again, and growing more frequent, had come those giddy flashes, and once, he wasn't sure, but it seemed as though he had fainted for a moment or two. It was getting on to ten o'clock now, and he sat, or rather lay forward with his head in his arms over the desk under the lighted lamp. The sounder was clicking busily. The kid raised his head a little and listened. There was a circus special, West, that night. And number two, the eastbound limited, was an hour off schedule, and trying to make it up, was running with clear rights while everything else on the train sheet dodged to the sidings to get out of the way. The sounder stopped for an instant, then came the dispatcher's complete. The circus special was to cross the limited at Laramie, the next station west of Angel Forks. It had nothing to do with the kid, and it would be another two hours at least before the circus special came along. The kid's head dropped back on his arms again. What was he to do? He could stick out the night somehow. He must stick it out. If he asked for a relief, it was the sack of the man upstairs. It was throwing McGrew cold. It wouldn't take them long to find out what was the matter with McGrew. And surely McGrew would be straight again by morning. He wasn't any better now, worse if anything. But by morning, surely the worst of the drink would be out of him. McGrew had been pretty bad all day, as bad as the kid had ever seen a man. He wondered a little numbly about it. He had thought once that McGrew might have had some more drink hidden, and he had searched for it during the forenoon while McGrew watched him from the bunk, but he had found nothing. It was strange, too, the way McGrew was acting. Strange that it took so long for a man to get it out of his system, it seemed to the kid. But the kid had not found those last two bottles. Neither was the kid up in therapeutics, nor was he the diagnostician that Dr. McTurk was. "'By morning,' said the kid with a groan, "'if he can't stand a trick, I'll have to wire.' I'm afraid tonight will be my limit. It was still and quiet, not even a breeze to whisper through the cut or stir the pine-clad slope into rustling murmurs. Almost heavily the silence lay over the little station buried deep in the heart of the mighty range. Only the sounder spoke and chattered at intervals spasmodically. An hour passed, an hour and a half, and the kid scarcely moved. Then he roused himself, it was pretty near time for the circus special to be going through to make its meeting point with the Limited at Laramie, and he looked at his lights. He could see them, up and down, switch and semaphore, from the bay window of the station where he sat. 
It was just a glance to assure himself that all was right. He saw the lights through red and black flashes before his eyes, saw that the main line was open as it should be, and dropped his swooning, throbbing head back on his arms once more. And then suddenly he sat erect. From overhead came the dull, ominous thud of a heavy fall. He rose from his chair and caught at the table as the giddiness surged over him and his head swam around. For an instant he hung there swaying, then made his way weakly for the stairs and started up. There was a light above. He had kept the lamp burning there, but for a moment after he reached the top nothing but those ghastly red and black flashes met his eyes, and then, with a strange inarticulate cry, he moved toward the side of the room, sprawled in a huddled heap upon the floor beneath the eaves, collapsed out like the snuffing of a candlewick, as Dr. McTurk had said some day he would go out, dead, lay Dan McGrew, the loose plank up, two empty bottles beside him as though the man had snatched first one and then the other from their hiding place in the wild hope that there might be something left of the supply drained to the last drop hours before. The kid stooped over McGrew, straightened up, stared at the lifeless form before him, and his hands went queerly to his temples and the sides of his head. The room spun dizzily around and around the lamp, the dead man on the floor, the bunks, a red and black flashed whirl, the kid's hands reached grasping into nothingness for support, and he slipped inertly to the floor. From below came the sharp tattoo of the sounder making the angel forks call, quick, imperative at first, and then like a knell of doom, in frantic appeal, the dispatcher's life and death, the seventeen, and hold circus special over and over again the sounder spoke and cried and babbled and sobbed like a human soul in agony over and over again while the minutes passed and with heavy resonant roar the long circus special rumbled by but the man on the night wire at angel forks was dead and the kid was past the hearing there were to come weeks while he raved in the furious delirium and lay in the heavy stupor of brain fever before a key meant anything to him again. It's queer the way things happen. Call it luck if you like, and maybe it is. Maybe it's something more than luck. It wouldn't be sacrilege, would it, to say that the hand of God had something to do with keeping the circus special and the limited from crashing head-on in the rock-walled Trysting Canyon four miles west of Angel Forks? Whatever might be the direct means, ridiculous, before unheard of, funny, or absurd, that saved a holocaust that night. That wouldn't be sacrilege, would it? Well, call it luck if you like. Call it anything you like. Queer things happen in railroading. But this stands alone, queerest of all in the annals of fifty roads in a history of fifty years. A limited thanks to a clean-swept track, had been making up time, making up enough of it to throw meeting point with the circus special at Laramie out, and the dispatcher had tried to hold the circus special at Angel Forks and let the limited pass her there. There was time enough to do it, plenty of it, and under ordinary circumstances it would have been all in the night's work. But there was blame, too, and Saxton, who was on the key at Big Cloud that night, relieving Donkin, who was sick, went on the carpet for it. He let the Limited tear through Laramie before he sent his order to Angel Forks. With the circus special in the open cutting along for her meeting point with nothing but Angel Forks between her and Laramie. That was the dispatcher's end of it. The other end is a little different. Whether some disgruntled employee seeking to revenge himself on the circus management loosened the door of one of the cars while the special lay on the siding waiting for a crossing at Mitre Peak, her last stop, or whether it was purely an accident. No one ever knew, though the betting was pretty heavy on the disgruntled employee theory. There had been trouble the day before. However, be that as it may, one way or the other, one thing was certain. They found the door open after it was all over, and... Uh, but we're overrunning our holding orders. We'll get to that in a minute. Bull Kusarat and Fatty Hogan in the 428 were pulling the special that night, 
and as they shot by the Angel Forks station, the fireman was leaning out of the gangway for a breath of air. "'Wonder how the kid's making it out,' he shouted in Hogan's ear, retreating into the cab as they bumped over the West End siding switch with a shattering racket. "'Good kid, that. Ain't seen him since the day he came up with us.' Hogan nodded, checking a bit for the curve ahead, mindful of his high-priced, heavily insured live freight. "'To devil you hear such a forsaken row!' he ejaculated irrelevantly. "'Listen to it, Bull. About three runs a year like this, and I'd be clawing at iron bars and trying to mimic a menagerie. Listen to it!' Kusarat listened. Every conceivable kind of an animal on earth seemed to be lifting its voice to high heaven in earnest protest for some cause or other. The animals, beyond any peradventure of doubt, were displeased with their accommodations, uncomfortable and indignantly uneasy. The rattle of the train was a paltry thing. Over it hyenas laughed, lions roared, elephants trumpeted, and giraffes emitted whatever noises giraffes emit. It was a medley fit for bedlam, from shrill, whistling, piercing shrieks that set the eardrums tingling to hoarse, cavernous bellows like echoing thunder. "'Might be something wrong with the animals,' said Kusarat, with an appreciative grin. "'They weren't yowling like that when we started. Guess they don't like their pullmans.' "'It's enough to give you the creeps,' growled Fatty Hogan. Kusarat reached for the chain, and with an expert flip flung wide the furnace door, and the bright glow lighted up the heavens and shot the black of the cab into leaping fiery red. Kusarat swung around, reaching for his shovel and grabbed Hogan's arm instead as a chorus of unearthly chattering shrieks rent the air. "'Why, a love of Mike, for God's sake, Fatty!' he grinned. "'Look at that!' Perched on the tender, on the top of the water tank, just beyond the edge of the coal, sat a well-developed and complacent ape. And as Kusarat looked, from the roof of the property car behind the tender, another swung to join the first. "'Jiminy Christmas!' yelled Hogan. "'screwed around in his seat. "'The whole blasted tribe of monkeys is loose. "'That's what's wrong with the rest of the animals. "'The little devils have probably been teasing them "'through the barred air holes at the end of the cars. "'Look at them! Look at them come!' "'Kusarat was looking. He hadn't stopped looking. "'Along the roof of the property car they came, "'a chattering, jabbering, swaying string of them, "'and on the brake wheel two sat upright, "'lurching and clinging for dear life, "'the short hair blown straight back from their foreheads "'with the sweep of the wind, "'while they peered with earnest, strained faces into the cab. "'And the rest, two dozen strong now, "'massed on the roof of the property car, "'perilously near the edges for anything but monkeys, "'inspected the cab critically, picked at each other's hides, made gestures, some of which were decidedly uncomplimentary, and chattered volubly to their leaders already on the tender. The tender seemed to appeal. Down came another monkey via the brake rod and swung by its tail with a sort of flying trapeze effect to the tender. And what one did, another did. The accommodation on the water tank was being crowded. The front rank moved up on the coal. Say, bawled Kusarat to his mate. Say, Fatty, get up and give em your seat. There's ladies present. And say, what are we going to do about it? The little pets ought to be put back to bed. Do nothing, snapped Hogan, one wary eye on the monkeys and the other on the right of way ahead. If the circus people don't know enough to shut their damn beasts up properly, it's their own lookout. It's not our funeral, whatever happens. The advance guard of the monkeys had approached too close to the crest of the high-piled coal, and as a result, while they scrambled back for firmer footing, they sent a small avalanche of it rolling into the cab. This was touching Kusarat personally, and Kusarat glared. Kusarat was no nature faker. He knew nothing about animals, their habits, peculiarities, or characteristics. He snatched up a piece of coal and heaved it at the nearest monkey. "'Get out, you little devil, scut! he shouted and missed, and the effect was disconcerting to Kusarat. Monkeys are essentially imitative, earnestly so, and not over-timid when in force. They imitated Kusarat. Before he could get his breath, first one and then another began to pick up hunks of coal and heave them back, and into the cab poured a rain of missiles. For an instant, a bare instant, Kusarat stood his ground, then he dove for the shelter of his seat. Soft coal? 
Yes, but there are some fairish lumps even in soft coal. Crash went the plate glass face of the steam gauge. It was a good game, a joyous game, and there was plenty of coal, hunks and hunks of it, and plenty of monkeys. The largest and most intelligent collection on earth, the billboard said. Crash went the cab glass behind Fatty Hogan's head, and the monkeys shrieked the light. They hopped and jumped and performed gyrations over each other, those in the rear, while those on the firing line with stern, screwed-up, wizened faces, blinking furiously, swung their hairy arms, and into the cab still poured the hail of coal. With a yell of rage clasping at his neck where the glass had cut him, Fatty Hogan pounced forward in his seat. "'You double-blank, blankety, blank, blank, triple-plated ass!' he bellowed at Kusarat. "'You the damn fool, you!' he screamed. "'Didn't you know any better than that? Drive em off with a hose! Turn the hose on them!' "'Turn it on yourself!' said Kusarat sullenly. He was full length on his seat, and mindful that his own glass might go as Hogan's had. "'Do you think I'm looking for glory and a wreath of immortelles?' "'Funny? Well?' Perhaps. Is this sacrilege, to say it wasn't luck? Crash! There was a hiss of steam, a scalding stream of water, and in a moment the cab was in a white cloud. Mechanically, Hogan slammed his throttle shut and snatched at the air. It was the water glass, and the water glass sometimes is a nasty matter. Kusarat was on his feet now like a flash, and both men, clamped jawed, groped for the cock, and neither got off scatless before they shut it and by then the train had stopped, and not a monkey was in sight. Jimmy Burke, the conductor, came running up from the rear end as Kusarat and Hogan swung out of the gangway to the ground. "'What's wrong?' demanded Burke. He had his watch in his hand. "'Monkeys,' said Hogan, and he clipped the word off without any undue cordiality. "'Huh?' inquired Burke. "'Monkeys,' said Hogan, a little more brittle than before. "'Monkeys?' repeated Burke politely. "'Yes, monkeys!' roared Hogan, dancing up and down with the pain of his scalded hands. "'Monkeys! That's plain enough, isn't it? Monkeys! Black you monkeys!' To the group came one of the circus men. "'The door of the monkey car is open,' he announced breathlessly. "'The monkeys have escaped!' "'You don't say!' said Kusarat heavily. Yes, said the circus man. And look here, we'll have to find them. They, they couldn't have gotten away from the train until it stopped just now. Are they intelligent? inquired Kusarat in a velvet voice. Same as the billboards say. Of course, said the circus man anxiously. Well, then just write them a letter and let them know when to be on hand for the next performance, said Kusarat grimly. "'There's lots of time. "'We can hang around here and stall the line for another hour or two, anyway.' "'Burke and Hogan were in earnest consultation. "'We're close on the limited time as it is,' said Hogan. "'And, and look at the cab.' "'Yeah, we'd better back up to the forks, then, and let her cross us there. "'That's the safest thing to do,' said Burke, and swung his lamp. "'Look here,' said the circus man. "'We've got to find those monkeys.' "'Burke looked at him unhappily.' Monkeys had thrown their meeting point out, and there was the trainmaster to talk to when they got back to Big Cloud. "'Unless you want to spend the night here, then you'd better climb aboard,' he snapped. "'All right, Hogan, back away!' and he swung his lamp again. Ten minutes later, as the circus special took the Angel Fork siding and the front-end brakeman was throwing the switch clear again for the main line, a chime whistle came ringing long, imperiously, from the curve ahead. Fatty Hogan's face went white. He was standing up in the cab and close to Kusarat, and he clasped the fireman's arm. "'What's that?' he cried. The answer came with a rush, a headlight cut streaming through the night. There was a tattoo of beating trucks, an eddying roar of wind, a storm of exhausts, a flash of window lights like scintillating diamonds, and the limited, pounding the fish plate at sixty miles an hour, was in and out and gone.' Hogan sank weakly down on his seat, and a bead of sweat spurted from his forehead. "'My God, Bull,' he whispered, "'do you know what that means? Something's wrong. She's against our order.' They found the kid and Dan McGrew, and they got the kid into little Dr. McTurk's hands at Big Cloud, 
but it was eight weeks and more while the boy raved and lay in stupor before they got the story. Then the kid told it to Carleton in the super's office late one afternoon when he was convalescent, told him the bald, ugly facts in a sort of hopeless way. Carleton listened gravely. It had come near to being a case of more lives gone out on the circus special and the limited that night than he cared to think about. He listened gravely, and when the kid had finished, Carleton, in that quiet way of his, put his finger instantly on the crux of the matter, not sharply, but gently, for the kid had played a man's part, and Royal Carton loved a man. "'Was it worth it, Keene?' he asked. "'Why did you try to shield McGrew?' The kid was staring hard at the floor. "'He was my father.' he said. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 Part 1 of The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator Chapter 9 The Other Fellow's Job Part 1 there is a page in Hill Division history that belongs to Jimmy Beezer. This is Beezer's story, and it goes back to the days of the building of the long-talked-of, figure-eight, canted-over, sideways tunnel on the Devil's Slide, that worst piece of track on the Hill Division, which is to say the worst piece of track bar none on the American continent. Beezer, generally speaking, was a fitter in the big cloud shops. Beezer, in particular, wore a beard. Not that there is anything remarkable in the fact that one should wear a beard, though there are two classes of men who shouldn't, the man who chews tobacco, and the man who tinkers around a railroad shop, and on occasions, when major repairs are the order of the day, is intimate with the niggerhead of a locomotive. Beezer combined both classes in his person, but with Beezer there were extenuating circumstances. According to Big Cloud, Beezer wore a beard because Mrs. Beezer said so. Mrs. Beezer, in point of size, made about two of Beezer, and Big Cloud said she figured the beard kind of took the cuss off the discrepancy. Anyway, whether that is so or not, Beezer wore a beard, and the reason it is emphasized here is because you couldn't possibly know Beezer without it. Its upper extremity was nicotine dyed in spots to a nut brown, and from thence shaded down to an indeterminate rust color at its lower edge. When he hadn't been dusting off and doing parlor-maid work with it in the unspeakable grime of a front end, in shape it never followed the prevailing tonsorial fashions. As far as anyone knew, no barber was ever the richer for Beezer's beard. Beezer used to trim it himself Sunday mornings, sort of half-moon effect he always gave it. He was a spare, short man, all jump and nerves, and active as a cat. He had shrewd brown little eyes, but owing to the fact that he had a small head and wore a large-sized black greasy peaked cap jammed down as far over his face as it would go, the color of his eyes could hardly be said to matter much, for when you looked at Beezer, Beezer was mostly just a round knob of uptilted nose and beard. Beezer's claim to immortality and fame, such as they are, were vested in disease. Yes, that's it, you got it right, disease. Beezer had a disease that is very common to mankind in general. There's a whole lot of men like Beezer. Beezer envied the other fellow's job. Somebody has said that the scarcest thing on earth is hen's teeth, but the man who hasn't some time or other gone green-eyed over the other chap's trick and confidentially complained to himself that he could sit in and hold it down a hang sight better himself has the scarcity of hen's teeth oracle nailed to the mast from the start. And a curious thing about it is that the less one knows of what the men he envies is up against the more he envies, and the better he thinks he could swing the other's job himself. There's a whole lot like Beezer. Now, Beezer was an almighty good fitter. Tommy Regan said so, and Regan ought to know. That's why he took Beezer out of the shops where the other had grown up, so to speak, and gave Beezer the roundhouse repair work to do. 
and that's where Beezer caught the disease, in the roundhouse. Beezer contracted a mild attack of it the first day, but it wasn't bad enough to trouble him much or see a doctor about, so he let it go on, and it got chronic. Beezer commenced to inhale an entirely different atmosphere, and the more he inhaled it, the more discontented he grew. An engine out in the roundhouse, warm and full of life, the steam whispering and purring at her valves, was a very different thing from a cold, rusty, dismantled boiler shell jacked up on lumbering blocks in the erecting shop. And the road talk of specials, holding orders, tissues, running time, and what not had a much more appealing ring to it than discussing how many inches of muck number 414 had accumulated on her guard plates, the incidental damning of the species wiper, and whether her boxes wanted new babbiting or not. Toiling like a slave ten hours a day for six days a week and maybe overtime on Sundays, so that the other fellow could have the fun and the glory and the fatter paycheck, and the easy time of it began to get Beezer's goat. The other fellow was the engineer. Beezer got to contrasting up the two jobs, and the more he contrasted, the less he liked the looks of his own, and the more he was satisfied of his superior ability to hold down the other over any one of the crowd that signed on or off in the grease-smeared pages of the Turner's book which recorded the comings and goings of the engine crews. And his ability, according to Beezer's way of looking at it, wasn't all swelled head either, for there wasn't a bolt or a split pin in any type of engine that had ever nosed its pilot on the hill division that he couldn't have put his finger on with his eyes shut. How much, anyhow, did an engineer know about an engine? There wasn't a fitter in the shops that didn't have the best engineer that ever pulled a throttle pinned down with his shoulders flat on the mat on that count. And there wasn't an engineer but would admit it, either. But a routine in which one is brought up, gets married in, and comes to look upon as a sort of fixed quantity for life, isn't to be departed from offhand, and at a moment's notice. Beezer grew ardent with envy, it is true, but the idea of actually switching over from the workbench to the cab didn't strike him for some time. When it did, the first time, it took his breath away, literally. He was in the pit, and he stood up suddenly, and the stay bolts on the rocker arm held, and Beezer promptly sat down from a wallop on the head that would have distracted the thoughts of any other man than Beezer. Engineer Beezer! He had to lift the peak of his cap to dig the tears out of his eyes, but when he put it back again the peak was just a trifle further up his nose. Engineer Beezer, a limited run, the Imperial Flyer, into division on the dot, hanging like a lord of creation from the cab window, cutting the miles on the grades and levels like a swallow, roaring over trestles, diving through tunnels. There was excitement in that something that made life worth living instead of everlastingly messing around with a hammer and a cold chisel and pulling himself thin at the hips on the end of a long-handled union wrench. Daydreams? Well, everybody daydreams, don't they? Why not Beezer? It is not on record that anyone ever metamorphosed himself into a drunkard on the spot at the first time he ever stepped up to a bar. But, as the Irishman said, "'Cape your foot on the rail, and yous have the makings of a dumbed fine bum in yous.'" Of course, the thing wasn't feasible. It sounded all right and was mighty alluring, but it was all dream. Beezer put it from him with an unctuous get thee behind me satan air, but he purloined a book of rules, road rules, out of Pudge McAllister's seat in the cab of the 1016. He read up the rules at odd moments, and moments that weren't odd, and gradually the peak of his cap crept up as far as the bridge of his nose. Beezer was keeping his foot on the rail. Mrs. Beezer found the book. That's what probably started things along toward a showdown. She was, as has been said, a very large woman. Also, she was a very capable woman, of whom Beezer generally stood in some awe, who washed and ironed and cooked for the Beezer brood during the day, and did overtime at nights on socks and multifarious sewing, including patches on Beezer's overalls, 
and other things which are unmentionable, the book fell out of the pocket of one of the other things one evening. Mrs. Beezer examined it, discovered McAllister's name scrawled on it, and leaned across the table under the paper-shaded lamp in their modest combination sitting and dining room. "'What are you doing with this, Mr. Beezer?' she inquired peremptorily. Mrs. Beezer was always peremptory, with Beezer. Beezer coughed behind his copy of the Big Cloud Daily Sentinel. "'Well?' prompted Mrs. Beezer. "'I brought it home for the children to read,' said Beezer, who, being uncomfortable, sought refuge in the facetious. "'Mr. Beezer,' said Mrs. Beezer with some asperity, "'you put down that paper and look at—' Mr. Beezer obeyed a little doubtfully. "'Now,' continued Mrs. Beezer, "'what's got into you since you went into the roundhouse? I don't know. But I sort of had my suspicions, and this book looks like em. You might as well make a clean breast of what's on your mind, because I'm going to know. Beezer looked at his wife and scowled. He felt what might be imagined to be somewhat the feelings of a man who is caught sneaking in by the side entrance after signing the pledge at a Blue Ribbon rally. It was not a situation conducive to good humor. There ain't anything got into me, said he truculently. If you want to know what I'm doing with that book, I, I'm reading it because I'm interested in it. And I've come to the conclusion that a fitter's job alongside of an engineer's ain't either better than a mud-picking Polax. You should have found that out before you went into the shops ten years ago, said Mrs. Beezer with a sweetness that tasted like vinegar. Ten years ago, Beezer flared. How's a fella to know what he's cut out for and what he can do best when he starts in? How's he to know, Mrs. Beezer? Will you tell me that? Mrs. Beezer was not sympathetic. I don't know how he's to know, she said. But I know that the trouble with some men is that they don't know when they're well off, and if you're thinking of... I ain't, said Beezer sharply. I said if, Mr. Beezer, and if... There's no if about it, Beezer lied fiercely. I'm not... You... Are, declared Mrs. Beezer emphatically, but with some wreckage of English due to exceeding her speed permit. Mrs. Beezer talked fast. When you act like that, I know you are, and I know you better than you do yourself, and I'm not going to let you make a fool of yourself and, and come home here dead some night and wake me up, same as poor Miss Darlene got her man back week before last on a boxcar door. Don't you know when you're well off? You an engineer. What kind of an engineer do you think you'd make? Why? Mrs. Beezer, said Beezer hoarsely. Shut up. Mrs. Beezer caught her breath. What? did you say? She gasped. I said, said Beezer sullenly, picking up his paper again, that I'd never have thought of it if you hadn't put it into my head, and now the more I think of it, the better it looks. I thought so, sniffed Mrs. Beezer profoundly. And now, Mr. Beezer, let this be the last of it, the idea. I never heard of such a thing. Curiously enough, or perhaps naturally enough, Mrs. Beezer's cold-water attitude had precisely the opposite effect on Jimmy Beezer to that which she had intended it should have. It was the side-entrance proposition over again. When you've been caught sneaking in that way, you might just as well use the front door on Main Street next time and have done with it. Beezer began to do a little talking around the roundhouse. The engine crews, by the time they tumbled to the fact that it wasn't just the ordinary grumble that any man is entitled to in his day's work, stuck their tongues in their cheeks, winked surreptitiously at each other, and encouraged him. Now it is not to be implied that Jimmy Beezer was anybody's fool, not for a minute. A first-class master fitter, with his time served, is a long way from being in that class right on the face of it. Beezer might have been a little blinded to the tongues and winks on account of his own earnestness. Perhaps he was, for a time. Afterwards, but just a minute, or we'll be running by a meeting point which is mighty bad railroading. Beezer's cap, when he took the plunge and tackled Regan, had got tilted pretty far back, so far that the peak stood off his forehead at about the same rakish angle that his upturned little round knob of a nose stuck up out of his beard, which is to say that Beezer had got to the stage where he had decided that the professional swing through the gangway he had been practicing every time, and some others that he had occasion to get into a cab, was going to be of some practical use at an early date. He put it up to Regan one morning when the master mechanic came into the roundhouse. 
Regan leaned his fat little body up against the jamb of one of the big engine doors, pulled at his scraggly brown mustache, and blinked as he listened. "'What's the matter with you, Beezer, hm? he inquired perplexedly when the other was at an end. "'Haven't I just told you?' said Beezer. "'I want to quit fitting and get running.' "'Talks as though he meant it,' commented Regan sotto voce to himself, as he peered earnestly into the fitter's face. "'Of course I mean it,' declared Beezer a little tartly. "'Why wouldn't I?' "'No,' said Regan. "'That ain't the question. The question is, why would you, hm?' "'Because,' Beezer answered promptly, "'I like a snap as well as the next man. "'It's a better job than the one I've got, "'better money, better hours, easier all around, "'and one I can hold down with the best of them.' "'Regan's eyebrows went up. "'Think so,' he remarked casually. "'I do,' declared Beezer. "'Well, then,' said Regan, "'if you've thought it all out and made up your mind, "'there's nothing I know of to stop you. "'Want to begin right away?' "'I do,' said Beezer again. It was coming easier than he had expected. There was a jubilant trill in his voice. "'All right,' said Regan. "'I'll speak to Clarahue about it. You can start in wiping in the morning.' "'Wiping?' echoed Beezer faintly. "'Sure,' said Regan. "'That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Wiping? A dollar ten a day?' "'Oh, well, look here,' said Beezer with a gulp. "'I, I ain't joking about this.' "'Well, then, what are you kicking about?' demanded Regan. Oh, "'About wiping and a dollar ten, said Beezer. W "'What would I do with a dollar ten, me with a wife and three kids?' "'I don't know what you'd do with it,' returned Regan. "'What do you expect?' Well, "'I don't expect to start in wiping,' said Beezer, beginning to get a little hot. "'Well, you've been there long enough to know the way up,' said Regan. "'Wiping, firing, you take your turn.' "'And your turn'll come for an engine according to the way things are shaping up now in, say, uh, about uh, fifteen years.' Fifteen years? "'Maybe,' grinned Regan. "'I can't promise to kill off anybody to accommodate you now, can I?' "'And don't the ten years I put in here count for anything?' queried Beezer aggressively. "'Why don't you start me in sweeping up the roundhouse? Wiping. Wiping my eye. What for?' I know all about the way up. That's all right for a man starting in green, but I ain't green. Why, why there ain't a year old apprentice over in the shops there that don't know more about an engine than any bloomin' engineer on the division. You know that, Regan. You know it hanged well, don't you? Well, admitted the master mechanic, you're not far wrong at that, Beezer. You bet I'm not, Beezer was emphatic. How about me, then? Do I know an engine every last nut and bolt in her, or don't I? "'You do,' said Regan. "'And if it's any satisfaction to you to know it, "'I wouldn't ask for a better fitter any time than yourself.' "'Well, then, what's the use of talking about wiping? "'If I'd put in ten years learning the last kink there is in an engine "'and have forgotten more than the best man of the engine crews will know when he dies, "'what's the reason I ain't competent to run one?' "'Regan reached into his back pocket for his chewing, "'wriggled his head, and till his teeth met in the plug, and tucked the tobacco back into his pocket again. "'Beezer,' said he slowly, spitting out an undesirable piece of stalk, "'did it ever strike you that there's a whole lot of blamed good horse doctors that'd make damn poor jockeys, hm?' Huh? Beezer scowled deeply and kicked at a piece of waste with the toe of his boot. "'All I want is a chance,' he growled shortly. "'Give me a chance and I'll show you.' "'You can have your chance,' said Regan. "'I've told you that.' "'Yes,' said Beezer bitterly. "'It's a hell of a chance, ain't it? "'A dollar ten a day, wiping. "'I'd be willing to go on firing for a spell.' "'Wiping?' said Regan, with finality, "'as he turned away and started toward the shops. "'But you'd better chew it over again, Beezer, "'and have a talk with your wife before you make up your mind.' "'Somebody chuckled behind Beezer, "'and Beezer whirled like a shot. The only man in sight was Pudgy McAllister. Pudgy's back was turned, and he was leaning over the main rod, poking assiduously into the internals of the 1016 with a long-spouted oil can, but Beezer caught the suspicious rise and fall of the overall straps over the shoulders of the fat man's jumper. Beezer was only human. It got Beezer on the raw, which was already pretty sore. 
The red flared into his face hard enough to make every individual hair in his beard incandescent as he walked over to Pudgy, yanked Pudgy out into the open, and shoved his face into the engineer's. "'What in the double blank blankety blank blazes are you grinning at?' he inquired earnestly. "'Hm?' said Pudgy. "'Yes, hm?' said Beezer eloquently. "'That's what I'm asking you.' Whether Pudgy McAllister was just plain lion-hearted or a rotten bad judge of human nature isn't down on the minutes. All that shows is that he was one or the other. With some labor and exaggerated patience, he tugged a paper-covered pamphlet out of his pocket from under the jumper. It was the book of rules Beezer had borrowed some time before. "'Mrs. Beezer,' said Pudgy blandly, "'was over-visiting the missus this morning, and she brought this back. From what she said, I don't know as it would do any good, but I thought perhaps if you were going to take Regan's advice about talking to your wife, you and Mrs. Beezer might like to look it over again together before you—' That was as far as Pudgy McAllister got. Generally speaking, the more steam there is to the square inch buckled down under the valve, the shriller the whistle is when it breaks loose. Beezer let a noise out of him that sounded like a green parrot complaining of indigestion and went at McAllister head on. The oil can sailed through the air and crashed into the window glass of Clara Hughes' cubby hole in the corner. There was a tangled and revolving chaos of arms and legs and lean and fat bodies, then a thud. There wasn't any professional ring work about it. They landed on the floor and began to roll, and a pail of packing and black oil they knocked over greased the way. There was some racket about it, and Regan heard it. So did Clarahue, and McAllister's fireman, and another engine crew or two, and a couple of wipers. The rush reached the combatants, when there wasn't more than a scant thirty-second of an inch between them, and the edge of an empty pit. But a thirty-second is a whole lot sometimes. When they stood them up and got them uncoupled, McAllister's black eye was modestly toned down with a generous share of what had been in the packing bucket, but his fist still clutched a handful of hair that had been separated from Beezer's beard, and Beezer's eyes were running like hydrants from the barbering. Take it all around, thanks mostly to the packing bucket, they were a fancy enough looking pair to send a high class team of professional comedians streaking for the sidings all along the right of way to get out of their road. It doesn't take very much, after all, to make trouble. Not very much. And once started, it's worse than the measles, the way it spreads. Mostly they guide Pudgy McAllister at first. They liked his makeup better owing to the black eye. But Pudgy was both generous and modest. What applause there was coming from the audience he wanted Beezer to get. He wasn't playing for the lead. And Beezer got it. Pudgy opened up a bit and maybe drew on his imagination a bit about what Mrs. Beezer had said to Mrs. McAllister about Jimmy Beezer, and what Beezer had said to Regan, and Regan to Beezer, not forgetting Regan's remark about the horse doctor. Oh, yes, trouble once started makes the measles look as though it were out of training and couldn't stand the first round. To go into details would take more space than a treatise on the manners and customs of the early Moabites, but summed up it was something like this. Mrs. Beezer paid another visit to Mrs. McAllister, magnanimously ignoring the social obligation Mrs. McAllister was under to repay the former call. Mrs. McAllister received Mrs. Beezer in the kitchen over the wash tubs, which was just as well for the sake of the rest of the house, for when Mrs. Beezer withdrew, somewhat shattered but in good order, by a flank movement through the back yard, an impartial observer would have said that the kitchen had been wrecked by a gas explosion. This brought Big Cloud's one lawyer and the Justice of the Peace into it, and cost Beezer everything but the odd change on his month's paycheck, when it came. Meanwhile, what with a disturbed condition of marital bliss at home, Beezer caught it right and left from the train crews, engine crews, and shop hands during the daytime. They hadn't anything against Beezer, not for a minute. But give a railroad crowd an opening, and there's no aggregation on earth quicker on the jump to take it. They dubbed him Engineer Beezer and Dr. Beezer, but mostly Dr. Beezer, out of compliment to Regan. And old Grumpy, the timekeeper in the shop, got so used to hearing it that he absent-mindedly wrote it down Dr. Beezer when he came to make up the payroll. 
That put it up to Carleton, the super, who got a curt letter from the auditor's office down east, asking for particulars, and calling his attention to the fact that all medical services were performed by contract with the company. Carleton scowled perplexedly at the letter, scrawled Tommy Regan's initials at the bottom of the sheet, plus an interrogation mark, and put it in the master mechanic's basket. Regan grinned, and wrote east, telling them facetiously to scratch out the doctor and squeeze in a J in front of the Beezer, and it would be all right. But it didn't go. You can't get by a high-browed set of red tape bound expert accountants of unimpeachable integrity who are safeguarding the company's funds like that. Hardly. They held out the money, and by the time the matter was straightened out, the pay car had come and gone, and Beezer got a chance to find out how good his credit was. Considering everything, Beezer took it pretty well. He went around as though he had boils. But if Beezer had a grouch and cause for one, it didn't make the other fellow's job look any the less good to Beezer. Mrs. Beezer's sharp tongue barbed with contemptuous innuendo that quite often developed into pointed directness as to her opinion of his opinions, and the kind of engineer he'd make, which he was obliged to listen to at night, and the men, who didn't know what an innuendo was, that he was obliged to listen to by day, didn't alter Beezer's views on that subject any, whatever else it might have done. Beezer had a streak of stubbornness running through the boils. He never got to blows again. His tormentors took care of that. They had McAllister as an example that Beezer was not averse to bringing matters to an intimate issue at any time. And what they had to say they said at a safe distance. Most of them could run faster than Beezer could, because nature had made Beezer short. Beezer got to be a pretty good shot with a two-inch washer or a one-inch nut, and he got to carrying around a supply of ammunition in the hip pocket of his overalls. As for McAllister, when the two ran foul of each other as the engineer came on for his runs or signed off at the end of one, there wasn't any talking done. Regan had warned them a little too hard to take chances. They just looked at each other sour enough to turn a whole milk dairy. The men told Beezer that McAllister had rigged a punching bag up in his backyard and was taking a correspondence course in pugilism. Beezer said curried words. Driving an engine, said they, is a dog's life. It's worse than pick-slinging. There's nothing in it. Why don't you cut it out? You've had enough experience to get a job in the shops. Why don't you hit Regan up and change over? By Christmas! Beezer would roar while he emptied his pocket and gave vent to mixed metaphor. I'll show you a changeover if I ever got a chance, and I'd show you there was something to run in an engine besides bouncing up and down on the seat like balls with nothing but wind in them and grinning at the scenery. A chance. That's all Beezer asked for. A chance. And he kept on asking Regan. That dollar ten a day looked worse than ever since Mrs. Beezer's invasion of Mrs. McAllister's kitchen. But Regan was obdurate, and likewise was beginning to get his usually complacent outlook on life, all men with a paunch have a complacent, serene outlook on life as a compensation for the paunch. It disturbed a little. Beezer and his demands were becoming ubiquitous. Regan was getting decidedly on edge. Firing, said Beezer. Let me start in firing. There's as much in that as in fitting, and I can get along for the little while that'll be before you're down on your knees begging me to take a throttle. Firing, eh? Regan finally exploded one day. Look here, Beezer, I've heard about enough from you. Fire it, eh? There'd have been some firing done before this that would have surprised you if you hadn't have been a family man. Get that? The trouble with you is that you don't know what you want or what you're talking about. I know what I want and I know what I'm talking about, Beezer answered doggedly. And I'm going to keep on putting it up to you till you quit saying no. You'll be a doing it a long time then said Regan bluntly, laying a few inches of engine dust with the blackstrap juice. A long time, Beezer, till I'm dead. But it wasn't. Regan was wrong about that, dead wrong. It's unexplainable the way things work out sometimes. End of chapter 9, part 1
of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter 9, The Other Fellow's Job, Part 2. That afternoon, after a visit from Harvey, who had been promoted from division engineer to resident and assistant chief on the Devil's Slide Tunnel, Carleton sent for Regan. Tommy, said he, as the master mechanic entered his office, did you see Harvey? No, said Regan, I didn't know he was in town. He said he didn't think he'd have time to see you, said Carleton. I guess he's gone back on number seven. But I told him I'd put it up to you anyway. He says he's along now where he's handling about half a dozen dump trains, but that what he's been given to pull them with, as near as he can figure out, is the prehistoric junk of the Iron Age. I saw the engines when they went through, Regan chuckled. All the master mechanics on the system cleaned up on him. I sent him the old 223 myself. Harvey's telling the truth so far. What's next? Well... Carleton smiled. He says the string and tin rivets they're put together with come off so fast he can't keep more than half of them in commission at once. He wants a good fitter set up there on a permanent job. What do you say? Say! Regan fairly shouted. Why, I say, God bless that man! Hmm? inquired Carleton. Beezer! said Regan breathlessly. Tell him he can have Beezer. Wire him I'll send up Beezer. He wants a good fitter, does he? Well, Beezer's the best fitter on the payroll, and that's straight. I always liked Harvey. Glad to do him a good turn. Harvey gets the best. Carleton crammed the dottle down in the bowl of his pipe with his forefinger and looked at Regan quizzically. I've heard something about it, said he. What's the matter with Beezer? packing loose around his dome cover and the steam spurts out through the cracked joints all over you every time you go near him said regan he's had me crazy for a month he's got it into his nut that he could beat any engineer on the division at his own game thinks the game's a cinch and is sour on his own that's about all but it's enough say you wire harvey that i'll send him beezer carleton grinned suppose beezer doesn't want to go he suggested He'll go, said Regan grimly. According to the neighbors, his home life at present ain't a perennial dream of delight, and he'll beat it as joyful as a live fly yanked off the sheet of fly paper it's been stuck on. Besides, he's getting to be a regular spitfire around the yards. You'll leave it to me. He'll go. And Beezer went. You know the Devil's Slide. Everybody knows it, and everybody has seen it scores of times, even if they've never been within a thousand miles of the Rockies. The road carried it for years on the back covers of the magazines, printed in colors. The Transcontinental's publicity man was a live one, and he played it up hard, and as a bit of scenic effect it was worth all he put into it. There was nothing on the continent to touch it. But what's the use? You've seen it hundreds of times. Big letters on top. Incomparable grandeur of the Rockies. And underneath, a scene on the line of the transcontinental, the coast-to-coast -coast route. Well, there wasn't anything the matter with the electrotypes, either. Nature backed up those ads to the last detail and threw in a whole lot more for good measure. Even a pessimist didn't hold a good enough hand to call the rays and had to drop out. Pugsley, the advertising man, was an awful liar, and what he said may not be strictly true, but he claimed the road paid their dividends for one quarter through the sale to a junk and paper dealer of the letters they got from delighted tourists telling how far short anything he could say came to being up to the reality. Anyway, Pugsley and the passenger agent's department were the only ones who weren't enthusiastic about the double-loop tunnel. It spoiled the scenic effect. This is Beezer's story. Beezer had rights through to the terminal and pictures of scenery, however interesting, and a description of how Harvey bored his holes into the mountainsides, however instructive, should naturally be relegated to the sidings. But there's just a word or two necessary before Beezer pulls out into the clear. One thing the electrotypes didn't show was the approach to the Devil's Slide. 
It came along the bottoms, fairly straight and level, the track did, for some five miles from the bend, until about a mile from the summit, where it hit a long, stiff, heavy climb that took the breath out of the best-type engine that Regan, representing the motive power department, had to offer. And here the last few hundred yards were taken with long intervals snorting roars from the exhaust that echoed up and down the valley and back and forward from the hills like a thousand thunders, or the play of a park of artillery. And the pace was a crawl. You could get out and walk if you wanted to. That was the approach of the Devil's Slide, on a westbound run, you understand. Then, once over the summit, the Devil's Slide stretched out ahead, and in its two reeling, drunken, zigzag miles, dropped from where it made you dizzy to lean out of the cab window and see the Glacier River swirling below, to where the right-of-way, in a friendly, intimate fashion, hugged the glacier again at its own bed level. How much of a drop in that two miles? Great percentages and dry figures don't mean very much, do they? Take it another way. It dropped so hard and fast that that's what the directors were spending three million dollars for, to divide that drop by two. It just dropped. Not an incline, not by any means, just a drop. However, when it was all over, the cause of it figured out something like this. We'll get to the effect and Beezer in a second. Engine 1016, with number one, the Imperial Limited, westbound, and with McAllister in the cab, blew out a stable one afternoon about two miles west of the bend. And uh, quicker than you could wink, the cab was all live steam and boiling water. The firemen screamed and jumped. McAllister, blinded and scalded, his hands literally torn from the throttle and air before he could latch in, fell back half unconscious to the floor, wriggled to the gangway, and flung himself out. He sobbed like a broken-hearted child afterwards when he told his story. "'I left her,' he said. "'I couldn't help it. The agony wasn't human. I, I couldn't stand it. I was already past knowing what I was doing. But, but the thought went through my mind that the pressure would be down and she'd stop herself before she got up the mile climb to the summit. That's the last I remember.' Dave Kinlock, the conductor, testified that he hadn't noticed anything wrong until after they were over the summit. They'd come along the bottoms at a stiff clip, as they always did, to get a start up the long grade. They had slackened up almost to a standstill, as usual, when they topped the summit. Then they commenced to go down the slide and were speeding up before he realized it. He put on the emergency brakes then, but they wouldn't work. Why? It was never explained. Whether the angle cock had never been properly thrown into its socket and had worked loose and shut off the air from the coaches, or whether, and queerer things than that had happened in railroading, it just plain went wrong. No one ever knew. They found the trouble there, that was all. The emergency wouldn't work, and that was all that Dave Kinlock knew then. Now, Beezer had been out on the construction work about two weeks when this happened, about two of the busiest weeks Beezer ever put in in his life. Harvey hadn't drawn the long bow any in describing what the master mechanics had put over on him to haul his dump carts with. They were engines of the vintage of James Watt, and Beezer's task in keeping them within the semblance of even a very low coefficient of efficiency was no sinecure. Harvey had six of these monstrosities, and as he had started his work at both ends at once, with a cutting at the eastern base of the Devil's Slide and another at the summit, he divided them up three to each camp, and it kept Beezer about as busy as a one-handed paper hanger with the hives, running up and down answering first-aid hurry calls from first one and then the other. The way Beezer negotiated his mileage was simple. He'd swing the cab or pilot of the first train along in the direction, up or down, that he wanted to go, and that's how he happened to be standing that afternoon on the track opposite the upper construction camp about a hundred yards below the summit, when number one climbed up the approach, poked her nose over the top of the grade, crawling like a snail that's worn out with exertion, and then began to gather speed a little, toboggan-like, as she started down the devil's slide toward him. Beezer gave a look at her and rubbed his eyes. 
There wasn't anything to be seen back of the oncoming big mountain racer's cab but a swirling white vapory cloud. It was breezing pretty stiff through the hills that day, and his first thought was that she was blowing from a full head, and the wind was playing tricks with the escaping steam. With the next look he gulped hard. The steam was coming from the cab, not the dome. It was the 1016, McAllister's engine, and when he happened to go up or down on her he always chose the pilot instead of the cab. Beezer never forced his society on any man. But this time he let the pilot go by him. There was something wrong, and badly wrong at that. The cab glass showed all misty white inside, and there was no sign of McAllister. The drivers were spinning, and the exhaust, indicating a wide-flung throttle, was quickening into a rattle of sharp, resonant barks as the cab came abreast of him. Beezer jumped for the gangway, caught the rail with one hand, clung there an instant, and then the tools in his other hand dropped to the ground as with a choking gasp he covered his face and fell back to the ground himself. By the time he got his wits about him again, the tender had gone by. Then Beezer started to run, and his face was as white as the steam he had stuck his head into in the empty cab. He dashed along beside the track, along past the tender, past the gangway, past the thundering drivers, and with every foot the 1016 and the Imperial Limited No. 1 westbound was hitting up the pace. When he got level with the cylinder, it was as if he had come to a halt, though his lungs were bursting and he was straining with every pound that was in him. He was barely gaining by the matter of inches, and in another minute he was due to lose by feet. But he nosed in over the tape in a dead run, flung himself sideways, and with his fingers clutching at the drawbar, landed, panting and pretty well all in, on the pilot. A minute it took him to get his breath and balance, then he crawled to the footplate, swung to the steam chest, and from there to the running board. Here, for the first time, Beezer got a view of things and a somewhat more comprehensive realization of what he was up against, and his heart went into his mouth and his mouth went dry. Far down below him, in a sheer drop to the base of the canyon wall, wound the glacier like a silver thread. In front, a gray, sullen mass of rock loomed up dead ahead, the right of way swerving sharply to the right as it skirted it, in a breathtaking curve, and with every second the 1016 and her trailing string of coaches was plunging faster and faster down the grade. The wind was already singing in his ears. There was a sudden lurch, a shock, as she struck the curve. Beezer flung his arms around the handrail and hung on grimly. She righted, found her wheelbase again, and darted like an arrow along the opening tangent. Beezer's face was whiter now than death itself. There were curves without number ahead, curves to which that first was but child's play, that even at their present speed would hurl them from the track and send them crashing in splinters through the hideous depths into the valley below. It was stop her, or death. Death, sure, certain, absolute and quick, for himself and every man, woman, and child, from colonist coach to the solid mahogany brass rail pullmans and observation cars that rocked behind him. There was no getting into the cab through the gangway. His one glance had told him that. There was only one other way, little better than a chance, and he had taken it. Blue-lipped with fear, that glance into the nothingness almost below his feet had shaken his nerve and turned him sick and dizzy. Beezer, like a man clinging to a crag, edged along the running board, gaining the rear end, and holding on tightly with both hands, lifted his foot, and with a kick shattered the front cab glass, another kick and the window frame gave way, and backing in feet first, Beezer began to lower himself into the cab. Meanwhile, white-faced men stood at Spence's elbow in the dispatcher's office at Big Cloud. Some section hands had followed Number One out of the bend in a handcar, and had found McAllister and his fireman about two hundred yards apart on opposite sides of the right-of-way. Both were unconscious. The section hands had picked them up, pumped madly back to the bend, and made their report. Carlton, leaning over Spence, never moved. Only the muscles of his jaw twitched. Regan, as he always did in times of stress, swore to himself in a grumbling undertone. There was no other sound in the room save the incessant click of the sender, as Spence frantically called the construction camp at the summit of the slide. There was a chance, one in a thousand, that the section hands had got back to the bend before number one had reached the top of the grade. Then suddenly the sounder spoke, and Spence began to spell off the words. Number one passed here five minutes ago. Regan went down into a chair and covered his face with his hands. Wild, he whispered. 
and his whisper was like an awe-stricken sob. Running wild on the devil's slide, no one in the cab. Oh, my God! There was a look on Carlton's face no words could describe. It was gray, gray with a sickness that was a sickness of his soul. But his words came crisp and clear, cold as steel, and without a tremor. Clear the line, Spence. Get out the wrecking crew and send the callers for the doctors. That's all that's left for us to do. But while Big Cloud was making grim preparations for disaster, Beezer, in no less grim a way, was averting it. And his salvation, together with that of every soul aboard the trade, came, in a measure at least, from the very source wherein lay their danger, the speed. That, and the fact that the pressure McAllister had thought would drop before the summit was reached, was at last exhausting itself. The cab was less dense, and the speed whipping the wind through the now open window helped a whole lot more, but it was still a swirling mass of vapor. Beezer lowered himself in, his foot touched the segment, and then found the floor. The 1016 was rocking like a storm-tossed liner. Again there came the sickening deadly slew as she struck a curve, the nauseating pause as she hung in air with whirring drivers. Beezer shut his eyes and waited. There was a lurch, another, and another, fast and quick like a dog shaking itself from a cold plunge. She was still on the right away. Beezer wriggled over on his back now, and with head hanging out over the running board, groped with his hands for the levers. Around his legs something warm and tight seemed to clinch and wrap itself. He edged forward a little further. His hand closed on the throttle and flung it in. A fierce, agonizing pain shot through his arm as something spurted upon it, withering it, blistering it. The fingers of his other hand were clasped on the air latch, and he began to check. Then, unable to endure it longer, he threw it wide. There was a terrific jolt, a shock that keeled him over on his side as the brake shoes locked, the angry grind and crunch of the wheel tires and the screech of skidding drivers. He dragged himself out and crouched again on the running board. Behind him, like a wriggling snake, the coaches swayed and writhed, crazily swinging from side to side in drunken, reeling arcs. A deafening roar of beating flanges and pounding trucks was in his ears, and shriller, more piercing, the screams of the brake shoes as they bit and held. He turned his head and looked down the right of way, and his eyes held there riveted and fascinated. Two hundred yards ahead was the worst twist on the slide, where the jutting cliff of old piebald mountain stuck out over the precipice, and the track hugged around it in a circle like a fly crawling around a wall. Beezer groaned and shut his eyes again. They say that in the presence of expected death, sometimes one thinks of a whole lot of things. Engineer Beezer, in charge of number one, the Imperial Limited, did then, but mostly he was contrasting up the relative merits of a workbench and a throttle, and there wasn't any doubt in Beezer's mind about which he'd take if he ever got the chance to take anything again. When he opened his eyes, old Piebald Mountain was still ahead of him, about ten feet ahead of him, and the pony truck was on the curve. But they had stopped, and Dave Kinlock and a couple of mail clerks were trying to tear his hands away from the death grip he'd got on the handrail. It was a weak and shaken beezer, a beezer about as flabby as a sack of flour, that they finally lifted down off the running board. There was nothing small about Regan. There never was. He came down on the wrecking train, and when he had a look at the 1016 and had heard Kinlock's story, he went back to the construction camp where beezer had been outfitted with leg and arm bandages. Beezer, said he, I didn't say all horse doctors wouldn't make jockeys, what? You can have an engine any time you want one. Beezer shook his head slowly. No, said he thoughtfully. I guess I don't want one. Regan's jaw dropped and his fat little face puckered up as he stared at Beezer. Don't want one, he gasped. Don't want one. After howling for one for three months, now that you can have it, you don't want it. Say, Beezer, what's the matter with you, hm? But there wasn't anything the matter with Beezer. He was just getting convalescent, that's all. There's a whole lot of men like Beezer. End of chapter 9
Chapter Ten, Part One of the Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Ten, The Rat River Special, Part One. This is Martin Bradley's story, an excerpt, if you will, from the pages of railroading where strange and grim things are where death and laughter lock arms in the winking of an eye, and are written down as though akin. There have been better men than Martin Bradley, and worse. Measure him as you will, that is one matter. In the last analysis, frailty is a human heritage, and that is another. On the Hill Division they called him a game man. Bradley was a fireman, a silent, taciturn chap, not sullen or surly, don't get that idea, more quiet than anything else, never much of anything to say. When his laugh was going around, Bradley could appreciate the fun, and did, only his laugh seemed tempered somehow by something behind it all. Not a wet blanket, not by any means. They didn't understand him then, perhaps, didn't pretend to. He never invited a confidence or gave one. But the boys would crowd up and make room for Bradley any time, as they dragged at their pipes and swapped yarns in the murk of the roundhouse at the midnight lunch hour, about the time Bradley used to stroll in, snapping his fingers together softly in that curious, absent-minded way he had of doing, for Bradley was firing for Smithers then on the 582 that took the local freight west out of Big Cloud in the small morning hours. Well set up? jumper tucked in his overalls, the straps over husky shoulders, thick through the chest, medium height, stocky almost, steady black eyes, a clean-shaven, serious face, the black hair grizzled a little and threading gray. That was Martin Bradley. A bit old to be still firing, perhaps, but he had had to take his turn for promotion with the rest of the men when he came to the Hill Division. He'd have gone up in time, way up, to the best on the division, probably, for Regan had him slated for an engine even then, only, but we'll come to that in a moment, there's just a word or two to clear the line before we have rights through to the terminal. Big Cloud in those days, which was shortly after the line was laid through the Rockies and the east and west were finally linked after the stress and toil and hardship and bitter struggle was over, was a pretty hard burg pretty hard. A whole lot harder than it is today. There was a big transient population of about every nationality on earth, for the road, just because they could operate it, wasn't finished by a good deal, and construction camps were more numerous than stations. Bridge gangs were still at work. Temporary trestles were being replaced with ones more permanent. There were cuts through the gray of the mountain rock to be trimmed and barbered with dynamite, and there were grades and approaches and endless things to struggle over, and, well, Big Cloud was still the mecca of the gamblers, the dive-keepers, and the purveyors of Red Eye, who would flock there to feed like vultures on the harvest of paychecks that were circling around. It was a pretty hard place, Big Cloud, everything wide open, not much of any law there in the far west in the shadow of the Rockies, it's different today, of course, but that's the way it was then, when Martin Bradley was firing on the Transcontinental. Bradley from the first boarded with the McQuiggins. That's how, probably, he came to think more of young Reddy McQuiggin, who was a wiper in the roundhouse, than he did of any of the rest of the railroad crowd. Perhaps not altogether for young Reddy's sake. Perhaps on account of Mrs. McQuiggin, and particularly on account of old John McQuiggin, who wasn't any good on earth a sodden parasite on the household when he was drunk, and an ugly brute when there wasn't any money forthcoming from the products of Mrs. McQuiggan's ubiquitous wash-tubs to get drunk with. For old John McQuiggan, between whom and Bradley there existed an armed truce, each regarding the other mutually as a necessary evil, had no job. For two reasons. First, because he didn't want one, and second, because no one would have given him one if he had. Mrs. McQuiggan, a patient, faded-out little woman, tireless because she had to be tireless, shouldered the burden and hid her shame as best she could from her neighbors. Reddy? No, he didn't help out much, then. Reddy used to stray a little from the straight and narrow himself, 
far enough so that it was pretty generally conceded that Reddy held his job in the roundhouse on account of his mother, who did Regan's washing, and as a matter of cold fact that was about the truth of it. And as a matter of cold fact, too, that was why the big-hearted master mechanic liked Martin Bradley. I don't know, Regan used to say, twiddling his thumbs over his fat paunch. I don't know. It's about the last place I'd want to board, with that drunken pickings from the scrap heap around. The only decent thing old John will ever do will be to die, hm? About a week of it would finish me. Bradley? Yes, he's hung on there quite a spell. Pretty good man, Martin. I don't know what Mrs. McQuigan would do without him. Guess that's why he stays. I'm going to give Martin an engine one of these days. That'll help out some. When? <laughs> when his turn comes. First chance I get. I can't poison off anybody to make room for him, can I? And now just a single word more while we're getting back the complete, to say that this had been going on for two or three years. Martin Bradley boarding at the McQuiggins and firing the 582. Young Reddy wiping in the roundhouse and on the ragged edge of dismissal every time the pay car came along. Mrs. McQuiggan at her wash tubs, old John leading his disreputable gin-soaked life, Tommy Regan between the devil of discipline and the deep blue sea of soft-heartedness anent the McQuiggan's son and heir, and we're off. The tissue buttoned in our reefer, off with a clean-swept track. It was payday, an afternoon in the late fall and growing dusk, the switch lights in the big cloud yards were already beginning to twinkle red and white and green, as Martin Bradley, from the pay car platform, his paycheck in his pocket, swung himself to the ground and pushed his way through a crowd of men clustered beside the car. He had caught sight of Regan across the spur, going into the roundhouse a moment before, and he wanted a word with the master mechanic, nothing very important, a requisition for an extra allowance of waste. And then, amongst the crowd, he caught sight of someone else and smiled a little grimly. Old John McQuiggan, as he always did on paydays, was hovering about first one and then another, playing good fellow and trying to ring himself in on the invitations that would be going around presently when the whistle blew. Bradley, his smile thinning a little as old John, catching sight of him in turn, sidled off, passed through the group, crossed the turntable, and halted abruptly, just outside the big engine doors, as Regan's voice came to him in an angry growl. Now mind what I say, Reddy. Once more, and you're through, for keeps, and that's my last word, understand? Well, you needn't jump a fella before he's done anything. It was Reddy McQuiggan answering sullenly. There was silence for a moment, then Regan's voice again, pretty cold and even now. I don't know, he said. I figure you must have been brought into the world for something, but I don't know what it is. You're not to blame for your father, but if I let a mother of mine, and near in sixty years, slave out the little time she's got left, I'd want to crawl out somewhere amongst the buttes and make coyote meat of myself. Jump you before you've done anything, hm? The little master mechanic's voice rose suddenly. I saw you sneak uptown an hour ago when you left the pay car. One drink for a start, hm? Well, you put another on top of it, and it'll be for a finish. I'd do a lot for that fine old lady of a mother of yours, and that's why I've taken the trouble to come over here and warn you what'll happen if you put in the night you're headed for. Tisn't because I can't run the roundhouse without you, me bucko. Mind that. Bradley was snapping his fingers in his queer, nervous way. Reddy McQuiggan made no answer. At least, Bradley did not hear any, but he heard Regan moving toward the door. He had no wish to talk to the master mechanic any more, not just at that moment anyhow, so he crunched through the engine cinders to another door, entering the roundhouse as Regan went out on the turntable and headed across the tracks to the station. Two pits away, Reddy McQuiggan, with a black scowl on his face, leaned against the steam chest of the 1004. Bradley, pretending not to see him, swung through the gangway and into the cab of the 582. There, for half an hour, he busied himself in an aimless fashion, but with an eye out for the young wiper as the latter moved about the roundhouse. The whistle was blowing and Reddy was pulling off his overalls as Bradley swung out of his cab again, and he was shading a match from the wind over the bowl of his pipe just across the turntable as Reddy came out. 
He tossed away the match, puffed, and nodded at McQuiggan. Hello, Reddy, he said in his quiet way, and fell into step with the boy. McQuiggan didn't answer. Bradley never spoke much, anyhow. They crossed the tracks and started up Main Street in silence. Here the railroaders in groups and twos and threes filled the street, some hurrying homeward, others dropping in through the swinging doors, not infrequently located along the right-of-way, where gasoline lamps flared out over the gambling hells, and the crash of tin-pan pianos mingled with laughter and shouting came rolling out from the dance-hall entrances. Bradley, with his eyes in front of him, walked along silently. Upon McQuiggan's young face had settled the black scowl again, and it grew blacker as he glanced now and then at the man beside him. Behind them came a knot of his cronies, and someone called his name. McQuiggan halted suddenly. "'Well, so long, Martin,' he said gruffly. "'I'll be up a little later.' Bradley's hand went out and linked the other's arm. "'Better come on home, Reddy,' he said with one of his rare smiles. "'Later,' Reddy flung out. "'Better make it now,' said Bradley quietly. The group behind had come up with them now, and crowding into Pharaoh Dave's place, paused a moment in the entrance to absorb the situation. "'Be a good boy, Reddy, and do as you're told,' one of them sang out. Reddy whirled on Bradley, the hot blood flushing his face. "'I wish you'd mind your own blasted business,' he flared. "'I'm blame good and sick of you tagging me. This isn't the first time. You make me weary. The trouble with you is that you don't know anything but the everlasting grouch you carry around. You're a funeral. You're a tightwad. Everybody says so. Nobody ever heard of you spending a cent. Go on, beat it. Leave me alone.' Bradley's face whitened a little, but the smile was still on his lips. You better draw your fire ready. There's no need of getting hot, he said. Come on home. You'll know what'll happen if you don't, and you know what Regan told you back in the roundhouse. So you heard that, huh? Reddy shot at him. I thought you did, and you thought you'd fool me by hanging around here playing innocent to walk home with me, huh? I wasn't trying to fool you, Bradley answered, and his hand went now to the wiper's shoulder. Let go, snarled Reddy. I'll go home when I feel like it. Bradley's hand closed a little tighter. Don't make a fool of yourself, Reddy, he said gravely. You'll... And that was all. McQuiggan wasn't much more than a boy, not much more than that, and hot-headed, and his chums were looking on. He freed himself from Bradley's hold with a smash of his fist into Bradley's face. Fight? No. There wasn't any fight. There was a laugh from old John McQuiggan, who had been trailing the young bloods up the street, and as Bradley, after staggering back from the unexpected blow, recovered himself, Reddy McQuiggan, followed by old John, was disappearing into Pharaoh Dave's El Dorado in front of him. Bradley went home alone. Supper was ready. It was always ready, as everything else was where little old Mrs. McQuiggan was concerned, and there were four plates on the red checkered tablecloth, as there always were, even on payday. Bradley sat down, with Mrs. McQuiggan opposite him. Not much to look at, Mrs. McQuiggan. A thin, sparse little woman in a homemade black alpaca dress. The gray hair, thinning, brushed smooth across her forehead. Wrinkles in the patient face, a good many of them. A hint of wistfulness in the black eyes that weren't as bright as they used to be. Not very pretty hands. They were red and lumpy around the knuckles. Not much to look at. Just a little old woman, brave as God Almighty makes them. Just Mrs. McQuiggan. Bradley, uneasy, glanced at her furtively now and again, ate savagely without relish. There wasn't much said, nothing at all about old John and young Reddy. Mrs. McQuiggan never asked a question. It was payday. There wasn't much said until after the meal was over and Bradley had lighted his pipe and pushed back his chair, with Mrs. McQuiggan lingering at the table, kind of wistfully, it seemed, kind of listening, kind of hanging back from putting away the dishes and taking the two empty plates off the table, and then she smiled over at Bradley as though there wasn't anything on her mind at all. Faith, pardon, she said. Sure, I don't know at all, at all what I'd be doing not seeing you around the house. But it's wondered I have often enough that you've not picked out some nice girl and made a home of your own. The words in their suddenness came to Bradley with a shock, 
and his face strained, he stared queerly at Mrs. McQuiggan. A little startled, Mrs. McQuiggan half rose from her chair. "'What is it, Martin?' she asked tremulously. For a moment more Bradley stared at her. Strange that she should have spoken like that to-night, when there seemed more than ever a sort of grim analogy between her life and his, that seemed like a bond to-night, drawing them closer, that seemed somehow to urge him to pour out his heart to her. There was motherliness in the sweet old face that seemed to draw him out of himself as no one else had for more years than he cared to remember, as even she never had before. "'What is it, Martin?' she asked again. And then Bradley smiled. "'I picked her out,' he said in a low voice. "'I'm waiting for a little girl that's promised some day to keep house for me.' "'Oh, Martin!' cried Mrs. McQuiggan excitedly. A "'And you never said a word.' Bradley's hand dove into his inside pocket and came out with a photograph, and the smile on his face now was full of pride. "'Here's her picture.' he said. "'Wait, Martin, wait till I get my spectacles,' exclaimed Mrs. McQuiggan, all in a flutter, and rising she hurried over to the little shelf in the corner. Then, adjusting the steel bows over her ears, with little pats to smooth down her hair, she picked up the photograph and stared at it, at the picture of a little tot of eight or nine, at a merry, happy little face that smiled at her roguishly. "'She's ten now, God bless her,' said Bradley simply. That was taken two years ago, so I haven't so long to wait, you see. Why, Martin, stammered Mrs. McQuiggan. Why, sure, you never said you was married. And the wife, Martin, poor boy, she's, she's dead. Bradley picked up the photograph and replaced it in his pocket. But the smile now was gone. No, I, I don't know. I had never heard, he said. He walked over to the window, pulled the shade, and stared out his back to Mrs. McQuiggan. She ditched me. I was on the pen then, doing well. I had my engine at twenty-five. I went bad for a bit. I'd have gone all the way if it hadn't been for the kitty. I'd have had more to answer for than I'd want to have. Blood, perhaps, if I'd stayed. So I pulled up stakes and came out here. He turned again and came back from the window. I couldn't bring the kitty, of course. It was no place for her. And I couldn't leave her where she was to grow up with that in her life, for she was too young then, thank God, to understand. So I'm giving her the best my money will buy in a girl's school back east, and... Uh, his voice broke a little. And uh, that's the little girl I'm waiting for. You make a home for me, sometime. Mrs. McQuiggan's hands fumbled a little as she took off her spectacles and laid them down, fumbled a little as she laid them on Brandley's sleeve. God be good to you, Martin, she whispered, and picking up some dishes, went hurriedly from the room. Bradley went back again and stood by the window, looking out, snapping his fingers softly with that trick of his when any emotion was upon him. Strange that he should have told his story to Mrs. McQuiggan tonight, and yet he was glad he had told her. She probably would never refer to it again, just understand. Yes, he was glad he had told her. He hadn't intended to, of course, it had come out almost spontaneously, almost as though for some reason it was meant that he should tell her, and— Bradley's eyes fixed on a small boy's figure that came suddenly streaking across the road and flung itself at the McQuiggan's little front gate. Then the gate swung, and the boy came rushing up the yard. Bradley thought he recognized the figure as one of the call boys, and a call boy running like that was always and ever a harbinger of trouble. Instinctively, he glanced back into the room. Mrs. McQuiggan was out in the kitchen. Bradley stepped quickly into the hall and reached the front door as the boy began to pound a tattoo with his fists on the panels. Bradley jerked the door open. "'What's wrong?' he demanded tersely. The light from the hall was on the boy now, and his eyes were popping. Say, he panted in a scared way, say, one of Reddy's friends sent me. There's a wild row at Faro Dave's. Reddy's raising the roof, and— Bradley's hand closed over the youngster's mouth. In answer to the knock, Mrs. McQuiggan was hurrying down the hall. What's the matter, Martin? She questioned nervously, looking from Bradley to the boy and back to Bradley. Nothing, said Bradley reassuringly. 
I'm wanted down at the roundhouse to go out with a special. He gave the boy a significant push gatewards. Go on, bub, he said. I'll be right along. Bradley went back into the house, picked up his cap, and with a cheery good night to Mrs. McQuiggan, started out again. He walked briskly to the gate and along past the picket fence. Mrs. McQuiggan had the shade drawn back and was watching him from the window, and then, hidden by the Cusarat's cottage next door, he broke into a run. It wasn't far. Distances weren't great in Big Cloud in those days. Aren't now, for that matter. And in less than two minutes, Bradley had Faro Dave's El Dorado in sight down Main Street, and his face set hard. He wasn't the only one that was running. Men were racing from every direction, some coming up the street, others he passed who shouted at him, and to whom he paid no attention. In a subconscious way, he counted a dozen figures dart in through the swinging doors of the El Dorado from the street. News of a row travels fast. Bradley burst through the doors, still on the run, and brought up at a dead halt against a solidly packed mass of humanity, Polacks and Swedes and Hungarians from the construction gangs, a scattering of railroad men in the rear, and more than a sprinkling of the harder element gathered from all over town, the hangers-on, the sharpers, and the card men, the leeches, the ilk of Pharaoh Dave who ran the place, and who seemed to be intent on maintaining a blockade at the far end of the barroom. The place was jammed everybody craning their necks toward the door of the back room where Faro Dave ran his stud, Faro and roulette layouts, and from there, over the shuffling feet of the crowding men in the bar, came a snarl of voices, amongst them reddies, screaming out in drunken fury incoherently. Bradley, without ceremony, pushed into the crowd, and the foreigners made way for him as best they could. Then he commenced to shoulder through the sort of self-constituted guard of sympathizers with the house, one of these tried to block his way more effectually. "'You better keep your hands off me, whoever you are,' the man threw at him. "'The young fool's been putting the place on the rough ever since he came in here. All Dave wants to do is put him out the back door.' "'Yes, he's boy, ready. No lies in bluff you. Saw him change cars myself. Damn thief, damn cheat. That's the boy, ready. It was old John McQuiggan's voice from the other room, high-pitched, clutter-tongued, drunken. Then a voice, cold with a sneer, and a ring in the sneer that there was no mistake in, Faro Dave's voice. "'You make a move, and I'll drop you quicker!' Bradley's arms went out with a quick, fierce movement, hurling the man who tried to block him out of the way, and fighting now, ramming his body and shoulders, throwing those in front of him to right and left, he half fell, half flung himself finally through the doorway into the room beyond. Too late. That's the boy, Rainy. It was old John's maudlin voice again. That's the... The picture seared itself into Bradley's brain, lightning quick, instantaneous, but vivid in every detail as he ran. The little group of men, three or four, who had been sitting at the game, probably, seeking cover in the far corner. Reddy McQuiggan, swaying a little, standing before a somewhat flimsy green-bazed card table, old John, too far gone to stand upright alone, leaning against the wall behind Reddy, Pharaoh Dave, an ugly white in his face, an uglier revolver in his hand, standing, facing Reddy across the table, the quick forward lunge from Reddy, the crash of the table as the boy hurled it to the floor and flung himself toward the gambler, the roar of a revolver shot, the flash of the short-tongued flame, a choking scream, another shot, the tinkle of glass as the bullet shattered the ceiling lamp, then blackness, all but a dull glow filtering in through the barroom door that for the first instant in the sudden contrast gave no light at all. Bradley, before he could recover himself, pitched over a tangled mass of wrecked tables. Over that, and a man's body. Somebody ran through the room, and the back door slammed. There were shouts now, and yells, a chorus of them from the barroom. Someone bawled for a light. Bradley got to his knees, and, reaching to raise the boy, wounded or killed, as he believed, found his throat suddenly caught in a vicious grasp, and Reddy's snarling laugh was in his ears. Let go, Bradley choked. Let go, Reddy. It's me, Martin. Reddy's hands fell. Martin, huh? He said thickly. I thought it was that. Reddy's voice sort of trailed off. They were bringing lamps into the room now, holding them up high to get a comprehensive view of things, and the light fell on the farther wall. Reddy was staring at it, his eyes slowly dilating, his jaw beginning to hang weakly. Bradley glanced over his shoulder. 
Old John, as though he had slid down the wall, as though his feet had slipped out from under him, sat on the floor, legs straight out in front of him, shoulders against the wall, and sagged a little to one side, a sort of ironic jeer on the blotched features, a little red stream trickling down from his right temple. Dead. Not a pretty sight. No. Perhaps not. But old John never was a pretty sight. He'd gone out the way he lived, that's all. It was Martin Bradley who reached him first, and the crowd hung back while he bent over the other, hung back and made way for Reddy, who came unsteadily across the room. Not from drink, now. The boy's gate. The drink was out of him. He was weak. There was a horror in the young wiper's eyes and a white, awful misery in his face. A silence fell. Not a man spoke. They looked from father to son. The room was filling up now, but they came on tiptoe. Gamblers, most of them, and pretty rough, pretty hard cases, and life held light. But in that room that night they only looked from father to son, the oaths gone from their lips, sobered, their faces sort of gray and stunned. Bradley, from bending over the dead man, straightened up. Reddy McQuigan, with little jabs of his tongue, wet his lips. "'The old man's gone, ain't he?' he said in a queer, lifeless way. "'Yes,' said Bradley, simply. McQuigan looked around the circle, sort of mechanically, sort of unseeingly, then at the form on the floor. Then he spoke again, almost as though he were talking to himself. "'Might just as well have been me that fired the shot,' he whispered, nodding his head. "'I'm the blame, ain't I?' And I guess, I guess I finished the old lady, too. He looked around the circle again. Then his hands kind of wriggled up to his temples, and before Bradley could spring to catch him, he went down in a heap on the floor. McQuigan wasn't much more than a boy, not much more than that, but old enough in another way. What he went through that night and in the days that followed was between McQuigan and his God. Life makes strange meeting points, sometimes, and sometimes the running orders are hard to understand, and sometimes it looks like disaster, quick and absolute, and everything in the ditch, and the right-of-way a tangled ruin, and yet when morning breaks there is no call for the wrecking crew, and it comes to you deep down inside somewhere that it's the great dispatcher who has been sitting on the night trick. End of chapter 10, part 1